I think the thing that probably irritated me the most is when we were doing due diligence, there was a resident who was a relative to the old owner. And his rent was 250 bucks a month. And everything was included. Water, gas, cable and internet, electricity. And I asked the broker, I was like, what what do you want me to do with this? Like, how can I make this work economically? And so the guy paid rent for three months. And then he didn't pay rent for the next three. And he didn't turn in his key, so we had to evict him. And this is like, we have have another- Dreamcatchers, where we make things happen. Dreamcatchers was formally launched to unlock the hidden potential in successful, self-motivated individuals who desire to take their life forward to the next level but need support to evolve. We are a collective group of professionals with various backgrounds that use our talents to assist those individuals in realizing their wildest dreams by providing education, inspiration, and direction. This podcast is where we share the lessons we've learned along the way to catching our dreams and give you some context around the how and the why to each approach to put you further ahead on the journey to catching your dreams. Are you ready? Hey, what's going on, Tribe? This is James Bryant from Better You For You. I'm here with my main man, Jerome Myers. Jerome, have we decided what we're going to call this episode that comes out midweek? We have no clue. Random ramblings. I like All right. iterations. Random ramblings. So <laughs> last week, we talked about um, you know, some of the obstacles that people face when getting into multifamily investing. One obstacle we talked about was um, education. The other obstacle that we really kind of honed into uh, was people saying that they don't have enough money um, or don't have the money to invest in multifamily properties. And, you know, one of the big takeaways is that, you know, really when it comes to investment, um, regardless if it's education, uh, whether it's uh, a real estate investment, we really are investing in ourselves as much as we are in that project. And so regardless of what you're doing, you have to really be ready and willing to invest in yourself. Um, investing in yourself, getting the education that you need, transforming your mindset so that you can be the investor that you need to be it, are one of the things that you really need to focus on. So, you know, today, you know, we were trying to figure out what we we're going to talk about. And, you know, one of the thoughts was, you know, we do a separate underwriting for these deals. So Jerome will do his underwriting with his assumptions. I'll do some underwriting and assumptions. And then we'll kind of get together like a mastermind and bring those things together and talk through what the different things are that we saw. And then we eventually come up with a model that we can both agree on and be able to explain uh, what what our assumptions are and why uh, coming from a couple of different perspectives. But sometimes, you know, no matter how well you plan, no matter how well you think it out, when you actually get the property and you're executing the plan, things don't always go according to plan. Um, And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that uh, today and just see where this conversation goes. So, you know, Jerome, uh, has this ever happened to you, kind of what we're talking about, where you you did your underwriting, you have your numbers, you go into it, and it executes exactly as you laid it out? Every time. I mean, I'm perfect. I know exactly what's going to happen before I close (laughs) every single time. (laughs) I know who's going to move out in the middle of the night. I know who has bed bugs and fleas and I know I know everything before we even get there. You know which HVAC units are going to clunk out in the middle of the summer? Absolutely. Without question. Okay. All right. Great. (laughs) And anybody who tells you that nonsense run run fast because the fact of the matter is nobody knows. Nobody knows. These apartments are wild animals, man. And so you know, trying to underwrite to a tenth of whatever percent is 
just absolutely ridiculous, man. <laughs> you got to have some fat in there. You don't know what's going to happen. I mean, we, let's look at Greenbrier, right? So that was yeah. our entry into the Greensboro market. Uh, we thought we were going to rehab four units. I'm at 15 right now. Yeah. Now, that was amazing for our top line revenue, but it definitely hurt our capital reserves. And, uh, uh, you know, what do you do with that? How, how do you plan for that? How do you know that in the first year you're going to have 15 turnovers? We, we had four vacancies when we took the property over. Within a month, we had seven. And then we continued to cycle people out because we realized that they weren't the type of people that we wanted to live in our community or because we raised rents, they moved away. Um, and I absolutely knew none of that before we went in, but I did decide that we were going to do a 30 for 5% vacancy for the first year. Mm -hmm. um, and I was right on that. Yeah. But we also made sure we had some additional contingencies as well in reserves uh, in that particular project. Um, yeah. Go ahead. We did. No, I mean, we did. And that's your genius, right? You're super conservative. And you wanted to make sure that if something happened, I didn't have to call anybody and say, hey, I need you guys to send me a check. <laughs> it's called a capital call, but that, yeah. this is how it manifests. Hey, I need to send me a check. We're out of money. Can you fix this for me? Yeah, and nobody wants, no operator wants to call the investors for another capital call. No, nobody, that's like a call of last resort. Make sure um, you use the proper terminology, your partners. Ah, this is true. The JV deal. That is true. That is true. <laughs> So you don't want to call your partners asking for additional resources. Um, that's something you really don't want to do. So you want to take care of a lot of that up front. But there are things that you cannot plan. And so it's not about preventing those things because those things are going to happen. It's about having some type of a plan and having the cushion in place to be able to absorb it, fix it, and move on. So you were talking about Greenbrier. You know, there were four vacant units when, you know, we, we took the property over. I think you said within the first month, there were, what, seven vacancies? So uh, three, two people moved out in the middle of the night. One person just decided they weren't going to pay rent. And so we ended up evicting them. But yeah. And, and then the other piece, too, is when you start transforming a property that has been neglected, there are going to be some deferred maintenance issues but there are going to be some tenants that don't want to pay for the additional services that you're providing. Um, in that particular one, um, you know, I recall when we did the inspections, talking to people who were saying they had maintenance tickets that were several years in waiting for action, whether it's uh, having windows repaired, whether it's, you know, doing something with railings. Um, people were really, in a bad in bad shape in terms of getting res a response to their maintenance issues. So we come in, we have the list, we start making repairs. Well, those repairs cost money and it actually costs money to run these properties properly and to invest in them. And then when you start doing that, you know, uh, some of the tenants don't want to pay the rent that's required in order to provide that level of service. Other tenants uh, liked it the way that it was so that they could do some other activities um, there in those units. And so we've spent um, the better part of a year transforming that property and continuing to just change the face and the atmosphere and uh, just the whole vibe of that community. Yeah, I mean, the one thing kind of a trick of the trade, insider tip for you guys. When you look at the parking lot, you can tell what type of property you have based on the cars in the parking lot. It's, it's sad, but true. And not so much like the make and model, but the year of the vehicle matters. Um, newer cars mean a little more disposable income. Um, broken down cars or vans or cars that look like they're being worked on in the parking lot is a 
pretty good indicator of some other things. So, you know, one of the ways that we measure is when you drive by, what does the parking lot look like? And is that parking lot full in the middle of the day? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Having a full parking lot in the middle of the day says something too. What, you have a lot of people working You got to have a lot of people working at home? Is that what it is? No. Nah, uh, not in the price range that we are. Maybe for the stuff that's, you know, $1,000 a month. But, okay. You no, know, I mean in that in that five to eight hundred dollar range, mm -hmm. most people aren't working from home. Okay, all right. So, what are some other things that you've learned, um, or based on your experience at Greenbrier, what were some of the things that you did differently in a deal that you've purchased after we purchased Greenbrier? Um. Uh... All the utilities are on every time that we do due diligence now. Mm -hmm. That's a non-negotiable. And I think that's the biggest one because there were just so many surprises in that transaction. At the same time that we did, at the same time that we did the Greenbrier transaction, we bought two quads that were one bedroom, one bath. And the owner... I don't want to say he misled me, but he wanted to sweep some stuff under the rug that was ended up being pretty big issues. And one of them was, and I don't know if I've talked about this before or not, but there was a raccoon that climbed into the ductwork, <laughs> fell down into the indoor unit. Oh, wow. And was seared on the heating strips for the furnace. Oh, my God. And so when we were walking through the unit, the resident had all of the ducts or vents taped off. And we're like, this is weird. And then they had window units going because it was summertime. And I was like, this is kind of silly here. And then anyway, we ended up in that space. I was like, okay, there's something going on here. I don't know what it is, but there's something wrong. Long story short, I told you guys the end of the story before we got started. The raccoon got into the attic, fell down into the condenser and winter. He was seeking heat, right? And so this was in this was in June when we were doing this walk. So for the six months, give or take a little bit, there was a raccoon melted on the oh, HVAC unit. Wow. Right? So I mean, and then he was like, it, so we turned on the unit and we got this awful smell that came out. And then it tripped off and he was like, oh yeah, I don't know. It's just stale air. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and so yeah, we, at the end of the day, we, we did a closing concession with them that allowed us to replace the unit if we needed to, because we didn't know how bad the issue was. But anytime somebody says, hey, don't worry about it, you probably want to worry about it. Yes. Yes. You absolutely want to worry about it. Absolutely. And even if even if you don't do anything with the pricing, if you don't retrade, as some people say is kind of a bad thing to do, uh, you at least want to go in eyes wide open. Because the worst thing you can do is just accept that there's nothing wrong, go mm -hmm. into the new deal, and then you've got this unexpected expense. Because mm -hmm. nobody likes to surprise us. Like, I, I don't know anybody that likes to surprise bills they might like surprise finding surprise money but nobody likes surprise bills yeah we don't like owing surprise money we like surprise income not surprise bills and so you know for so for that property uh, the one that you per that we purchased after greenbrier which was towns at lindley park you know one of the challenges uh on that property is that the former owners ran it as student housing and so they were renting out the property by the bedroom, but not all of the units had both bedrooms occupied. So there were some that would have, you know, there were a couple of townhome units where there were people paying for the quote unquote bedroom of one unit, but they had full access to the whole townhouse because the other bedroom wasn't rented. And it was, and it's also, since it was set up as student housing, 
that also meant that all of the utilities were being paid by the owner. And so we've had to really go in and transform that property from student housing into a workforce housing model. Uh, so Jerome, what are some of the challenges that we faced in doing that transition? Where to begin, my friend? Where to begin? Uh, so I guess it's important to say one thing here, and I don't know, it's, it's painful for me, right? Because you go to these places where the area is better, but you still see the same issues. Mm -hmm. You still see bugs, you still see people using drugs, you still see all these things that are traditionally undesirable. And it's like, okay, well, all right, we crossed over this street, so things are supposed to be different now. But the fact of the matter is, it seems like all these problems are pretty persistent throughout. And for those of you that don't know, Jerome's talking about the demographic around the locations of the two different complexes that we're talking about, um, which is, you know, Greenbrier, which is kind of on in an in-between area. I mean, right behind where Greenbrier is at is a swank class A, you know, apartment complex that really abuts to our property. But with on the particular road that our property is on, there are some undesirable elements on the extreme ends of that street. And there's some things that were going on on that property that we had to go in and make sure that we took care of. Um, the other property, Townsville Lonely Park, is not too far from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. And compared to where Greenbrier is at, the area as a whole is much more affluent. But we still ran into the same human condition issues in both places. Yep. And so it's interesting, though, when you look at this, I don't know if it's census data, census data or I don't know who the other reporting body is that some people use, but mm -hmm. when you look at that data, the Greenbrier area is ranked a B and the Spring Garden property is ranked a C, mm. believe it or not. So, you know, I, I don't know what determines the affluence in this particular software product that we were using to look at the different areas, but I, I just thought that was interesting um but so <laughs> there there's so much there right we came in we knew so our business plan was this was a paper um improvement we were doing basically we were changing the way that the leases were rented or written and by changing the way the leases were written we thought that we were going to be able to reduce some expenses and we in our pro forma, we dropped down what we thought our rent or our income was going to be for the sake of giving us some of that cushion. And so what happened is we were, we were able to exceed or meet, we were able to exceed our rent projections. Um, and actually, they, what we're able to collect today is consistent with what our aggressive pro forma said, but we didn't share that with anybody that joined us on the deal. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we, we thought we were going to be able to come in and just consolidate units where people were just one person in a unit and that didn't work. It still hasn't worked. Um, <laughs> people who didn't have roommates, didn't want roommates and they made it pretty clear. Uh, I think the thing that probably irritated me the most is when we were doing due diligence, there was a resident who was a relative to the old owner and his rent was 250 bucks a month and everything was included, water, gas, cable and internet, electricity. And wow. I asked the broker, I was like, what, what do you want me to do with this? Like, how can I make this work economically? And so the guy paid rent for three months and then he didn't pay rent for the next three. And he didn't turn in his key, so we had to evict him. And this is like, we have a yet another- Hey guys, back in 2016, me and the team decided to formalize Dreamcatchers as an organization that could help people achieve their wildest dreams. If this is you, 
Please visit our website at dreamshouldbereal.com in order to find out the details of our services and how we can help you become a dream catcher. Talk to you soon. Well, I won't call it that. We had one person in the unit and then another person who wasn't paying. And so what we decided before we went into the property is, hey, we're going to get everybody on one lease, right? So everybody's responsible for the whole amount of the unit. And that way we don't have to worry about these issues where one person moves out, one person gets evicted, whatever. Uh, that actually is working out really well. Yeah. And so we're, we're walking down the path of the business plan. And as usual, when we get into a project, we get asked the question, are you sure you want to do it this way? Um, <laughs> and every time we've told them, yeah. And them is whoever the property management company is. Yeah, we, we, we want to try the business plan that we, we put together before we bought the property. Well, it might create some issues. Yeah, we understand. But we want to try to do the business plan that we said we were going to do. Yeah. It made sense before we bought the property. We don't see anything that makes it not make sense now. So let's do it. And it seems like we're getting rewarded for that stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, but I mean, you know, there's the little things. And you talk about, you know, level of service and some other stuff. You know, we walked in to that property the old property management company cut the power off the day before we closed. Yeah. They cut the gas off. It's February, by the way. They cut the gas off so people don't have heat. They don't have electricity. Um, fortunately, we were on site when the water company came out to turn the water off because that was next. And so, you know, it, there's some common decency, some common courtesy that we kind of expect when a property changes hands, but mm -hmm. we didn't get much of that there. And, you know, there's nothing that we can really do, but we do have to suffer the brunt of the blowback from people who are upset and frustrated because, well, they couldn't and, turn on their heat. And what I would say is just like when we talked about Greenbrier and the issue that we had with, making sure that the utilities were on when we did our due diligence. I think um, as the case study here is making sure that we have a utility transition plan in place uh, when, we clo when we're closing on the property and that the people that we're purchasing it from in the property management firm, um, you know, every, everybody's on the same page as we're moving forward with that. Because that's, you know, it, it reflected bad on us um, as the new owners to, oh, man, as soon as this property has changed hands, now the utilities are off and people couldn't, you know, because we're still in wintertime. Um, and so it made for a difficult week, you know, there on property. Yeah, more like nine days on the gas. It was, it was bad. Nobody wanted to come out. And I mean, but those, perfect example, right? Those residents have been mistreated for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a young couple there who, man, I don't know. They decided that they just weren't going to pay rent. So from January to May, they didn't pay rent. Then they got evicted. And we put a judgment on, you know, their social security number or whatever. And so in July, they came back and paid everything that they were they owed us and so you know it, it you can pay us while you're there or you can pay us after you leave but you are going to pay us yeah that's yeah. kind of the long and the short of it i mean or you're going to have a really hard time finding some place to live with your name being on the lease and mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of folks out there that try to practice this cash for keys thing where they pay somebody to move out so that they can re-rent the unit I think that's a bad practice because all you do is pass tenants around or residents around who aren't going to pay their rent. And then nobody can, nobody's being warned after the bad experience. And I feel like owners, we, we need to align. I think we need to protect each other because I mean, who wants to get a resident who's not going to pay? I, right. I deeply desire for there to be some honor and integrity in the game. And it, I don't think it's appropriate for me to make that resident who's not, uh, 
I don't want to say behaving, but I don't have another word that comes to mind. Have them go be somebody else's problem. It's like when, when you're at a job and you have someone maybe working on a team that's not pulling their weight, but then you give them a glowing recommendation to so that they can go and work for another unit because then they can be somebody else's problem. Yeah. Yeah, nobody wants to do that. You know, because you don't want your name associated with that person and what they're doing. It's like you don't want uh, to be passing around tenants that are not living up to their end of the bargain. You know, a lot of times we'll hear and you'll see the stories about the landlords that are not really holding up their end of the bargain. Um, But there is part of that bargain that that tenant um, is, is coming to the table to hold as well. So it is a partnership between us as owners and the tenant. Um, And we really want to make sure that we're continuing to do our part in that partnership because we really do believe in doing well while doing good. Um, You know, we believe in that we can continue to be profitable while providing a great level of service in the units that we own. We express that to all of our partners We talk about that with our property management firm, and we want to make sure that everybody understands where we are and where we're coming from so that there can be no misunderstandings about what we're talking about. None whatsoever. I think we're very clear on that. Yeah, I mean, if we we don't improve the community, then I think all this is for naught. Right. That is correct. So back to the challenges there. So the (laughs) the outside HVAC units failing one after another, after another, after another, and after being stress tested by the May and June heat, it was just all right. Another service call. Another service call. Oh, this condenser's failed. Oh. Let's get a new unit in. Let's get a used unit in. Let's solve these issues. But, Mm -hmm. you know, it just, it continues. You know, once you get things in shape and you figure out what the true deferred maintenance is, then you can get a game plan together and execute on it. But until you actually get in there, you don't know. You can guess, but you don't know. And I mean, I, I, I'm troubled because I was looking at a deal today for somebody and they're buying it with interest only on hard money and that interest only is for three years. And the deal only works because they have the interest only dollars. Mm. And if they ever have to do principal pay down, then the cash flow goes negative. Is that a sound strategy? I guess for some, but for me, I mean, I want the deal to work if, you know, you, you're actually paying down the debt and you've got to hold it for more than three to five years. Yeah, to, for that one, I'm not familiar with that deal, but it really depends on the property, the operational plan, what kind, you know, the turnaround that they have in uh, getting the forced appreciation. Um, I would be uh, a little bit concerned just with the general investment environment that we have in with the, you know, with the mortgage rates and the different discussions on Fannie and Freddie. And there's a lot of different headwinds that we're facing um, that I would really be concerned if I had a three year interest only. Um, And then that fourth year I had to refinance or do something because I don't know, I don't think anybody knows where the economy is going to be, but it seems that the headwinds are there that I would, be pretty careful in terms of making that kind of investment and that kind of deal. Yeah. I mean, and this one's huge. There's not a whole lot of people that can, that can buy it. I mean, it's 50 million. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, you know, I just, I always want to be in a place where if I have to buy it and hold it, I want to be able to hold it because the 
underwriting is solid. And I didn't used to call it underwriting. I used to call it something else, but somebody said underwriting along the way and I just adopted it. But, you know, doing your actual financial model mm -hmm. and making sure that you've got some conservative assumptions in there is the only way from my perspective to make sure that if something terrible happens and like you have to keep the property that you can actually keep the property without being in dire straits. And, See, and that's it's, the difference. Yeah. And, I, and it's finding that balance because, you know, you're much more aggressive than I am. I'm much more conservative. So we find that balance in how much reserves need to be there. What's the actual time frame for the transition of the property. And as time goes on, our numbers may get closer and closer initially, but it's that, you know, we're just coming at it from two different perspectives. Um, and I think that works and that, that helps get us to where we need to go. Yeah, I know. That's funny that you said I'm much more aggressive than you because everybody I talk to says, you're the most conservative right I've ever talked to. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I think it's hey. all in the assumptions. It's all in the assumptions yeah. that we make. And I think what you're more aggressive on, and I think it's, you've been proven right, is the ability to grow rents. I think that's one of the, the things that I've been like, are we really going to be able to grow rents that fast? And you're like, yeah, well, this is what we're going to, this is the plan and what we're going to do. And you've absolutely been proven right on that. Uh, for me, I'm always making sure that we have a slightly extra cushion on expenses or that if we're going to transition from paying utilities to the tenant paying utilities, that we have a reasonable transition. Like it doesn't go from we're paying 100% of the utilities in month one to them paying 100% of the utilities in month three. It's not going to work that fast. Unfortunately. No, no, nothing works as fast as I want it to work. Nope. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, listen, we're just, we get on here on, on these midweek talks and we're talking about the deals that we've done. We're talking about random thoughts and things that we have. If you have any, if any of the listeners want to connect with us and maybe share some thoughts on this podcast or any of the other sessions, Jerome, what's the best way for them to connect and even ask some questions. And hey, if we get your questions, we'll, we'll ask the questions and we will answer the questions uh, when we do our next session next week. Oh, cool. That, now, we're, now we got a Q&A show. Oh, man. We're going to start having people call into the show next. This is hey, okay. Great. Have them kind right. of pop in. Oh, man, that's, that's sophisticated. I don't even know how to do it. I don't know how we're going to do that, but yeah. <laughs> We'll call the tax guys. I mean, we got them on call, right? Anyway, um, yeah, I mean, so I'm on LinkedIn, right? So Jerome Myers, M-Y-E-R-S. I'm the only one in Greensboro, North Carolina. And I'm the only one that says I buy and fix broken apartment businesses. So, you know, you can reach out to me there or you can hit the developing website. It's up to ease of three. So D3V3LOPING.com. And hit us on the contact us form. Yeah. So we would love to hear any suggestions for topics for us to talk about on these rambling midweek sessions. Uh, some topics or, or questions that you want us to answer uh, the next time that we do this podcast. I think that would be great. We, we're absolutely looking forward to connecting with you. Yeah, man. And if you are interested in getting you know, that inside access closed Facebook group is growing every single day. And, you know, we're starting to curate the content in there. And I mean, I like it. People introducing themselves from all over the country. It's, it's, it's pretty exciting, man. Um, but that's a way to connect and get more frequent interaction and actually have two way communication instead of just checking us out via the podcast. And so how are they going to find out about that? Oh, so there's a website called Myers Methods, M-Y-E-R-S-M-E-T-H-O-D-S.com. And you can register there for that. And um, there's a bunch of other stuff that's coming. We're doing a, uh, a beta test on our 
multifamily investing course. And so we're going to select a few people to help us go through that. And I've actually had five people that want to sign up today. So that was pretty cool considering I just put the message out there. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so let's, uh, yeah, I mean, Myers Meth is developing with the ease is threes or LinkedIn. And, you know, we'll go from there, man. All right. And anybody that wants to connect with me to talk about uh, coaching, you know, breaking through your limiting beliefs, getting you to the position where you're ready from a mindset perspective to move forward with your investing activities, you can reach me at betteryouforyou.com. B E T T E R Y O U, the number four, you.com. If you want to learn more about Dreamcatchers, please visit the website at dreamsgiverreal.com. If you can think of someone who would benefit from these types of opportunities and are willing to share what we're doing with them, we would greatly appreciate it.